It's been said that everything Aristotle taught is false. The physicist J.D. Bernal once wrote that the history of science is largely, in fact, the story of how Aristotle was overthrown in one field after another. And honestly, I'll be darned if there's not some truth to that. Indeed, Aristotle's teachings eventually became so dominant that they were a straitjacket that bound scientists and philosophers for many generations. But let's not punish the teacher for the failings of his students. Aristotle took the teachings that Plato handed to him, riddled with mysticism and numerology, and finally brought us the beginnings of the scientific method. Aristotle broke with his teacher Plato in that he believed we must first observe the universe to find out how it works. Only then can we form credible theories. And in the end, if our observations disagree with our theories, it's our theories that are wrong. Aristotle's theories were always intended to be tentative, awaiting the next set of observed facts to test them. And it's for that method that we remember Aristotle as the father of science. If his later followers forgot his method and only remembered his incorrect theories, that's their mistake, not his. Aristotle had a profound impact on the history of physics. But the spread of Greek science and culture throughout much of the West was made possible by his most famous student, Alexander the Great. Peloponnesian War, Athens' hegemony in the region was destroyed by Sparta. But Sparta wasn't really able to pick up the slack, and Greece was subject to broken armistices, broken alliances, and general political chaos. And up north in Macedonia, strange things were afoot. The Macedonians had been ruled by a long series of kings, and about this time the latest, King Philip, ascended to power. Philip had studied and mastered the latest military techniques in Thebes and proceeded to improve upon them, creating a battle formation we call the Macedonian Phalanx. He then proceeded to form a professional army and began to expand his territory. Meanwhile, in 384 BC, Aristotle was born in Stagira in Macedonia, the son of the physician of the old king of Macedonia. So he grew up with some familiarity of court life. At the age of 17, he was sent to Athens for a proper education, where he attended Plato's academy, and he remained there for 20 years. At the academy, Aristotle started out as a faithful follower of Plato but as time went on, doubts began to creep in. When Plato died, Aristotle left the academy and accepted an invitation from another former student, Hermias. Hermias had become the ruler of Atarnius on the western coast of modern-day Turkey and set up a school in Assos near Lesbos, which is where Aristotle went. The three years Aristotle spent in Assos, away from the academy, gave him the space to develop his own flavor of philosophy. He was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with Plato's method of explaining the universe. Aristotle shared the same ambitious goal, but began questioning whether we can really just sit back and reason our way through everything. How can we explain the universe if we don't even really know what the universe is like? 
Shouldn't we first begin by observing and classifying the universe as it really is? Only then can we see if our explanations actually work. He was getting closer to the modern scientific viewpoint that observation is the final arbiter of truth. Nature is subtle, far subtler than human argument, and it's easy to be fooled by hidden assumptions and small mistakes in reasoning. Observation is more conclusive. Aristotle stated it clearly. If your theory disagrees with observed facts, the observed facts are right and your theory is wrong. And boy did Aristotle observe and classify. When all was said and done, his writings span the topics of physics, mechanics, astronomy, meteorology, botany, zoology, psychology, not to mention ethics, economics, politics, metaphysics, and literature. More on that later. But it's here that our two tales meet, because about this time, King Philip's son, Alexander, better known these days as Alexander the Great, was 13 years old and in need of a tutor. A royal offer was extended, and the royal offer was accepted. So Aristotle tutored the young Alexander for three years, poetry, history, geography, ethics, politics, all the things an aspiring young conqueror of worlds would need. During this time, Aristotle tutored not just Alexander, but several Macedonian nobles, many of whom would become Alexander's friends and future generals, including perhaps Ptolemy, who was an important name in the history of science, as we'll soon see. It was under his rule that the Library and Museum of Alexandria were built. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. Because soon enough, at the age of 16, Alexander was called away to help his father, who was out fighting wars. Aristotle remained Alexander's friend and advisor for much of the rest of his life. That is, until Alexander had Aristotle's great-nephew killed. During the next few years, Alexander joined his father Philip in fighting wars, and they eventually succeeded in conquering the Greeks at the Battle of Chironea, ending Greek independence until the 19th century. But their plan to rule the galaxy as father and son didn't last long, because one day King Philip turned up with a knife stuck in him. Everyone agrees his bodyguard did it, though no one agrees on why. And so it is that Alexander, at the tender age of 20, found himself in charge of a vast war machine, ready to continue his father's plans. Now you could take a whole class and nothing but Alexander the Great, but to go into too much detail would take us far off track, so let's keep it short. After suppressing the inevitable rebellions that rose up after his father's death, Alexander proceeded to conquer the known world. The Balkans, the Levant, Syria, Babylonia, Persia, of course. And most important for us, the people interested in physics, he conquered Egypt. There he was declared the son of a god by an oracle. But then, of course, those Egyptians used to call people the sons of God every second Tuesday, so maybe that's not all that interesting. But what is interesting is that he founded the city of Alexandria there, or at least one of 17 cities that he founded and called Alexandria. But this one is by far the most important, the one people think of when you say Alexandria. This is where what I'd call the golden age of Greek science occurred. But the story of the museum and the library of Alexandria will have to wait for another episode, because Alexander didn't dally. He continued his conquests, making his way to the Indus River in northern India, at which point his troops started to feel like, hey, isn't this thing ever going to end? And they forced him to turn back. He ended up leading his men through the Gadrosian Desert, which was a disaster. He finally made it to the Strait of Hormuz, after heavy losses. Soon after, hanging out in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar II in Babylon, after a bout of drinking, he caught fever and suddenly, in the year 323 BC, just died. And people have speculated on the causes ever since. In any event, whether due to poison or natural causes, at the young age of 33, 
Alexander had conquered more territory than anyone before had dreamed of. And so what of Aristotle this whole time? Well, it seems that shortly after Greece had fallen to Alexander and his father Philip, Aristotle returned to Athens. Being from Macedonia himself, he couldn't have been welcomed by everyone, only those in favor of collaboration with the Macedonians. In Athens, he decided not to go back to Plato's academy, but to found his own school, called the Lyceum. But he came with the support of the most powerful man around, Alexander the Great. Alexander provided money for Aristotle, but that wasn't all. Alexander was profoundly influenced by his old tutor and cared about ideas and learning. He loved reading, science, history, literature, and often had to send for more books while on his military campaigns. And he also brought along historians and philosophers and naturalists to record and bring back specimens and exhibits for Aristotle's Lyceum to make his teaching more concrete. This is very important. In a way, this is the most important distinction between Aristotle's Lyceum and Plato's Academy. It's not just that Plato's Academy didn't have exhibits, it's that the Academy didn't need exhibits. The Academy dealt in far less concrete, less tangible matters. Aristotle taught his students to observe the world and learn from it, to start from the tiny specific details which you can observe, and by induction reason your way back to the big abstract ideas. This is the exact opposite of Plato, who started with the big abstract ideas, then tried to draw logical conclusions from them. You see, Plato followed a more mathematical type of reasoning. In mathematics, you start with certain simple, important propositions and reason your way down to specific cases. We sometimes call this deductive reasoning. This method has a great appeal because you get to work with the important, fundamental ideas straight from day one. And if you're doing your job right, there's not much uncertainty at every step. Now, it's not that Aristotle wasn't a mathematician. But that's not what he's famous for. He's famous as the father of science. And in the empirical sciences, you turn this process on its head. You don't know what the simple, important, fundamental principles are that lead to our universe. You can only observe the specific cases. So you look out at all the particular cases and try to figure out what the simple laws and general principles are that govern the world. Richard Feynman once compared this process to trying to guess the rules of chess just by watching people play. We sometimes call this inductive reasoning. This method, the method of science, is much messier than the first. You have to get your hands dirty and sit and observe the world even when you don't know where your observations are leading. They might never lead anywhere and you're studying little tiny parts of the problem that might not seem all that significant at first. It's not a sexy job, but it turns out that this method is the one that leads to all of our scientific knowledge. And that's why the reports and specimens that Alexander sent back to Aristotle and his Lyceum were important. So what exactly did Aristotle teach at the Lyceum? You'll have to wait for the next episode for that. For now though, after Alexander's death, the tides turned against the Macedonians, and by extension, Aristotle. Remembering the fate of Socrates, Aristotle decided to flee Athens, lest the Athenians sin twice against philosophy. Aristotle died in 322 BC. And though he died just one year after his student Alexander the Great, he lived to a much older age, 62 versus Alexander's 33, which is fortunate because it takes far longer to understand the world than to conquer it.